Time to say a very good morning. A little bit earlier than we normally speak to him, Alberto Costa. Uh, Alberto, thank you very much indeed for waking up so early to talk to us. Well, good morning, Mike, and thank you for inviting me on to your excellent show as ever. It's only a pity that I, I come on to your shows uh, to talk about a, a brutal man like Colin Pitchfork. Yes. But here we are again, Mike. Um, Colin Pitchfork has yet again succeeded in having another parole hearing. Uh, let's just cast our minds back. Mm. Uh, and you correctly said that Colin Pitchfork had brutally and disgracefully committed two of England's most appalling crimes. Mm. He raped, strangled to death Linda Mann and Don Ashworth. And we must never forget that this whole thing is not about Pitchfork, it's about them mm. and ensuring that justice uh, is shown towards them and the families and friends. And I've lost count, Mike, of the number of constituents in South Leicestershire that come up to me, and it's usually women of my age. I, I'm 53 this yeah. year. And Linda and Don would be roughly my age. Women that say, you know, it might have been many years ago that Colin committed these appalling crimes, but I was friends with Don, or I went to school with Linda, right. or uh, I lived in the area that they lived in. And it's as if it was yesterday, these mm. crimes. We must never forget that for many hundreds of people, it's still very vivid uh, in their uh, memories. Of course, and you and I have spoken many times about this, Alberto, as you say, um, uh, on, on this on this uh, talk station. And I mean, I think this is his third parole hearing, but what we shouldn't also forget um, is that when he was ori originally released the first time around, he was released into the community um, and he was recalled just a couple of weeks later because he was found to have been hanging around outside a school a secondary school, uh, which obviously would lead one to believe that he has not been rehabilitated, that he still has an unhealthy interest in, in young women um, and, and young girls, and in fact he is a danger to society. Well, that's right. So he was uh, released uh, in 2021 against my wishes, yeah. and I applied uh, to the Secretary of State for Justice, the then Secretary of State for Justice, for what's called reconsideration mm. of a decision. Um, the parole board reconsidered and chose to release him. So they released him and lo and behold, within two months, he was recalled back into prison, this time not into open prison, but a full closed prison. Mm. So he was recalled into prison and that's where he has remained. And then in spring of last year, he applied again successfully for parole. I challenged that. Again, I approached the Justice Secretary. The Justice Secretary engaged the reconsideration mechanism. The Parole Board had a fresh hearing uh, in uh, just a few months ago in winter of last year, mm. and they reconsidered the whole matter and agreed it would be irrational to release him. And so it was reconsidered that it would be wrong to release him. So we were delighted with that outcome. But what happened then? What happened is that Mr. Pitchfork asked for reconsideration of a reconsidered decision. Yes. And I discovered from the Ministry of Justice that Mr Pitchfork can ask for reconsideration of a reconsidered decision mm. limitless times and cost free to him. So I've now directed part of my campaign, Mike, to try and get these parole board reconsideration mechanism rules amended because mm. they weren't brought in to allow prisoners limitless opportunities cost free to keep challenging decisions right. we need some legal certainty to this we should have a parole board decision with an opportunity for an internal reconsideration that's what should happen yes not limitless times well also but surely the principle must be um that there, there must be expert witnesses or something who can be called to say well, what makes you think that this man is in any way different from the man that was released in 2021? And how can you be so sure that he's different? And if you are able to be sure that he's different, can you guarantee that he won't be found hanging around outside of school? Well, that's absolutely correct. And that's why I applied to the chair of the parole board, Caroline Corby. Yeah. Uh, I applied to her a number of months ago and said, look, if this case isn't one that should be held in public, I don't know what is. Mm. Uh, and parole board hearings are, it's very rare that they're heard in public. They're heard usually in private, yes. very opaque process. But yesterday, to give credit to the chair of the parole board, yesterday I received the letter, Mike, 
that confirmed that my application for Colin Pitchfork's next parole hearing to be held in public has been granted. Mm. And, and that's a that fantastic, means, it's a fantastic thing that you've done, Alberto, I must say. Thank you. And what that means, Mike, is that journalists will be able to hear the evidence that Mr Pitchfork himself presents mm. via his lawyers as to why he thinks he should be released, as well as the evidence that will be presented against. So members of the public, the way it will work is that there will be a, a virtual transmission because the parole hearing itself will be held in a secure location. It's usually held in a prison, but it will be transmitted and it will be broadcast probably, and I'm waiting for the details, but probably in a courtroom. Mm. And members of the public will be invited to that. But most importantly, journalists, professionals like yourself, will be invited to attend mm. that courtroom to hear the parole hearing and hear for themselves, most crucially, the evidence of those experts that you rightly identified, Mike, that will either give evidence for Mr yes. Pitchfork or indeed against. And so members of the public, and particularly my South Leicestershire constituents, will be able to uh, adduce for themselves whether or not they think Mr Pitchfork has been sufficiently rehabilitated that he no longer presents mm. a danger to the public. Yes. Well, I mean, I think we both know the answer to that question. But, but interesting as well, because people have often said to me, They'd like to see more of the inner workings of the Parole Board because the Parole Board has made some decisions over the course of the last few years which have been questionable at best. But you can't really ever get to the heart of how they came to those decisions or who was responsible for making those decisions. So I welcome this and hope to see more of this kind of thing so that we can actually see how the pro how process works. Exactly. And you're quite right to see, uh, again, the background. Let's not forget the black cab rapist, John yes. Wardroy's, who was disgracefully released by the parole board back at the beginning of 2018. Yeah. That's what led the then Justice Secretary to introduce the reconsideration mechanism mm. rules. They were introduced with the right intention. It was to allow, uh, because if you remember at the time with the John Warboys case, the government was powerless to issue judicial review proceedings, yeah. but you can't issue judicial review proceedings against yourself. Yeah. The minister was nominally responsible for the independent parole board and couldn't issue proceedings against himself. So we had to wait a third party issuing judicial mm. review proceedings against the war boys case. It led to the uh, um, uh, sacking of the then chair of the parole board. Uh, and, of course, the decision being quashed in, mm. in John Warboys. So the reconsideration mechanism rules allow the Secretary of State now to ask the parole board to think again. But what they were never intended to do was to allow a prisoner yeah. to ask limitless times, cost-free, for reconsiderations of reconsidered decisions. And that's where we need to now change those rules. Yes. Well, I presume that won't be addressed in, the, in, in this particular parole hearing. But are you confident that this might be the last parole hearing we have? Or, or will, will, will we expect to have one sort of every 18 months or so from Pitchfork? Unfortunately, Pitchfork was sentenced under a different regime, Mike. Mm. And whilst we've correctly changed the law when it comes to people that commit these sorts of crimes, if Pitchfork had committed his crimes today, or even one of his crimes, mm. appalling that that would be, he would likely get what's called a whole life tariff. Yes. Meaning yeah. that he would spend most, if not all, of his natural life behind bars, regardless right. of whether he's been rehabilitated. But he was sentenced under a different regime, and that means that he has the right to apply mm. for parole every two or so years. Yeah. So this, this won't be over. What, but what we will see at the public hearing, and this is why it's so important, what you and I and all your listeners will f and viewers will finally get to see is the evidence for and against Pitchfork on whether or not he still presents as a dangerous man to the public. Yes, absolutely right. Well, we shall look forward very much to, to seeing all of that and, and getting that information. So thank you again, Alberto, for, for your very, very hard work on, on this campaign. Let me just ask you before I let you go, uh, Jeremy Hunt today uh, making a speech. Uh, we saw Keir Starmer unveiling his six plans for improving Britain yesterday. I can't say I thought too much of them, to be honest. Um, but, of course, we've, we've got Jeremy Hunt saying, you know, it's going to be sure as night follows day, um, if you vote Labour, taxes will go up. Um, 
The problem for the Tories, of course, is that we're paying an awful lot of tax at the moment already. This is the highest tax burden we've had, I think, since the Second World War. Um, do you not think that it's time for Jeremy Hunt to actually say, we're going to lower them? Yes, I, I very much want to see lower tax. I'm a Tory. I believe in appropriate levels of taxation. That doesn't mean no taxation. We have to pay for defence. We have to pay for schools. We have to pay for uh, infrastructure. But the taxation levels have to be appropriate. And as a Conservative, um, I, I agree that, of course, there's arguments to be had to, to lower taxation. But he's also right, Jeremy, to say that Labour will increase taxation. Well, Labour are going to wallop 20% on school fees, private school fees. And by the way, that's the sort of politics of envy uh, because all that will happen is once they wallop that 20% on school fees, people that can just about afford to send their kids to private schools, what are they going to do? They're going to send their kids to normal state schools and that's fine, but the cost to us as taxpayers will go up. So not only will uh, there'll be this double whammy on, on, on parents, but the cost to the taxpayer will go up. These are the barmy tax policies, the mm. politics of envy. That and I'm it's already, it's already costing promoting. It's already costing twenty-two million pounds, according to the Telegraph this morning. You know, the raid on private schools uh, has meant that at least three thousand fewer pupils started at private schools in this academic year compared with twelve months earlier. Which, of course, will also put more pressure um, on the state school system in in all sorts of different parts of the country. Um, so it's a mad idea, isn't it? Mad. I mean, look what what Keir did yesterday with his uh, with his. I mean, it was a pledge card. He went back in time to yeah. 1997, didn't he? It was yeah. just a, a another uh, card uh, with pledges. Although he didn't use the word pledge because obviously he was advised not to for, right. for various reasons. <laughs> and it wasn't five; it was six to differentiate from Tory Blair. Yeah, but it's a, a rehash. Although I looked at I looked at, at the Edstone and the Edstone, if you remember it back in the day of, of Ed Miliband, that had six pledges on it as well. Yeah, but the, the, I mean, look, let, let, I mean that that was such a farcical promotional uh, mishap by the Labour Party. Uh, goodness knows what happened to that uh, <laughs> in, in oversized tablet of stone. But look, Keir Starmer presents a real danger to the taxpayer because, on the one hand, as you've correctly identified, he keeps overspending this twenty-two million. Goodness knows he's he's a twenty-two million. He keeps stretching it out to cover all sorts of things. The reality is that whilst I agree with your listeners and viewers that the taxes are perhaps a bit too high and we do need to lower them. Uh, you can be sure as uh, night follows day that having a Labour government, taxes will go much higher than they are at the moment and even higher still once you get right into the middle of a Labour government. Mm. So think very hard and careful about what's at stake at the next election. It's a choice between a Conservative Party that in principle has always believed in appropriate taxation uh, uh, versus a Labour Party whose ideolo ideology is committed to a bigger state, bigger spending, because they seem to think that the state knows best, the state can solve everybody's problems, which of course is not what a, a good Conservative government thinks. No. Well, let's hope so. Uh, Alberto, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, once again, for taking the time uh, to talk to us about this terrible story, Colin Pitchfork's uh, pending release and continuous uh, parole board hearings.